Hello! <laughs> Welcome to an adventure. Uh, today is Wednesday, um, February 16th. There's a date on there and you know, I totally didn't just have to look at the computer to find out. Anyway, welcome to the archives. <laughs> I am the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Um, you may know me on Twitch as Rogan27. Uh, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the um, Community Collections Archivist here. And once a week on, the, on both the VT Well Studios channel and the Rogan27 channel, I stream from the archives, and that's what this is. So for the next two hours, we're going to explore stuff from the archives. Um, let me just say hello to, I see a couple of people in chat already. So uh, welcome Lord Portico, good to see you. Hi Rykar, um, I'm, I'm suspicious as to whether you're actually a bot because you say that there are no robots here. So um, yeah, that kind of makes you look suspicious, but thank you so much for the resubscription there. Um, <laughs> matching hoodies today, woo! Um, and uh, hi Fludan and Hannah. Um, before we dive into the topic of today's stream, um, I am going to do what I do at the top of every one of these streams. Oh, and that is turn on captions. <laughs> Since they were not on. All right, hopefully captions are on now. Uh, thanks to the uh, caption tool for giving a reminder on one of my two channels. Um, Hi, Key Squared. <laughs> um, but what I do at the top of every stream is I read the um, land and labor acknowledgement from Virginia Tech, uh, since that's where we're broadcasting from, and I think it's important. So, <clears throat> Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our, of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to utprosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. Oh, yes, and the captions should be working now. Thank you, Portico, for confirming that. Um, so thank you uh, for letting me read that at the top of every stream. Not that you really have much of a choice, but for sticking around while I do, because I think it's important to pay attention to what the university is committing to. And um, by paying attention regularly to what that statement is, we have the opportunity to try and hold the institutional, uh, institution accountable for the things it has committed to doing. So, this week's adventure is centered around a single title from our Rare Books collection, which is not something that I have done before. Uh, we have multiple volumes of this title, but it is just one title. This week, because uh, two weeks ago was the anniversary of the publication of this book, it has been 100 years since this book was published, we are going to be looking at Ulysses by James Joyce. Um, so hopefully you're interested in literature. Uh, James Joyce was an Irish author. <clears throat> and so 
technically, I believe Ulysses ends up getting categorized with British classical literature, um, even though it's Irish literature. Um, and our archives used to collect both uh, American and British literature. Uh, we no longer have a focus in that area, but we do have some actual, like, interesting copies of um, some of these literature pieces. So that is what we're going to be looking at today. Um, and I don't know, I think we'll start with the original publication. Oh, and we have a 16-bit Eric joining us with the Whimsies. Hello, Whimsies! Um, I will give a couple of seconds uh, and just sort of vamp uh, in case people are getting ad rolls as they're coming in. But hello, hello Raiders. If anybody was here who doesn't already follow 16-Bit Eric, do give a follow over to 16-Bit Eric. Um, if you are aware, uh, we have featured TTRPG content on the VTUL Studios channel before. Um, I have DM'd a game and played in a couple of games on the channel. 16-Bit uh, Eric is an expert on all things TTRPG, so if you are at all interested in that aspect of the university's programming, uh, you should definitely throw a follow over to Eric. Um, absolutely a good bean there. Um, <laughs> Hi Crafty Becky and hello Be Right UK. Thank you so much for the resubscription there. Um, I, do, I do appreciate that quite a lot. Um, so for everybody who's just arriving, um, I am uh, Rogan27. I am also known as Anthony Wright Day Hernandez. I am the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And today is when I do my uh, show from the archives here. And um, what we are focused on today is Ulysses by James Joyce. Uh, it was published 100 years ago this February. Uh, so I thought we would take a look at the book and um, the unique copies that we have in our collection here um, and kind of explore. I don't know much about Ulysses other than that it was written by James Joyce, an Irish author. Uh, so that is, that's what we're going to explore today and um, I hope you'll stick around and if you know stuff about um, this book, the history of it, if you studied literature in college or whatever, I would love to have you weigh in. I am definitely not an expert on this content area, uh, but I have some unique and interesting things to share uh, with regard to it from our collections. Um, and we will look at them together. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, get the camera situated here so that I can share what we have. Also, how is everybody today? How uh, did you enjoy Eric's stream? Um, I mean, I hung out there quite long until I had to run away for this. So I know it was a good stream as normal. Uh, but all right, I'm going to switch us over to the camera view here. And you all should be able to see a book. A book that looks like a box because this is an original copy of Ulysses by James Joyce from 1922, and it is indeed in a box. Uh, this is gonna be really blurry. I apologize. Let me autofocus there, because that's really close up. That's the side. Um, I can show you what this looks like down here in the little detail view. So originally published 1922, Ulysses by James Joyce. Um, as I said, I don't know the story. I have not read it, <laughs> which is part of the fun of uh, me exploring things in this archive. As you can see, the little box um, the cover of is actually torn off. Uh, so I can set it on here, but it just comes right off. It was originally meant to fold open. But we have the actual manuscript inside. And this was independently published. So it was not published through a major publisher of the time. 
So it's more akin to like a vanity publication that somebody would do today where um, they spend some money or they go and get a small publisher to do it for them or you know they publish through like Amazon or something like that. Um, we've got a lovely little cover here. I can switch it sideways here so you can see the entirety of it. Let me I may have to get out the foam blocks. We'll see. Yeah, I'm going to get the foam blocks. Uh, because the binding is a little gentle on this. A little gentle. The binding is a little um, less sturdy, I guess would be the way to say it. Uh, so let me stick this on these little foam here so that I'm not opening it all the way. Because I want to show off, as you can see, 1922, there was already a list of, by the same author, Chamber Music, Dubliners, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and Exiles, uh, which were published by the Egoist Press, London. However, Ulysses was not published by that press. Ulysses, let me see, I can angle this here, was published by Shakespeare and Company, 12 Rue de l'Odéon, 12 Paris, 1922. So it was published by Shakespeare and Company in Paris in 1922. Um, like I said, I'm not an expert. I do not know the full story. I do know that there's some information in one of the other issues that we have um, that talks about why it was published in Paris. To uh, droit de reproduction de traduction. I don't know that word. Uh, et the adaptation reserves pour tous les pays y compris la Russie. Copyright by James Joyce. Um, so that's in French. I can get a little bit of it, but honestly, I took like one year of French in like sixth grade. Uh, but this is basically giving uh, some information about um, reproduction of it and whether you're allowed to is my assumption uh, since it is on the copyright page. All rights reserved. Yes, in all the countries comprising Russia. Got it. Thank you just here for coffee. I'm sure my pronunciation was very bad. Um, I knew it was something along the lines of like an all rights reserved statement just from context and the little bits of meaning that I was able to get from it, but I wasn't able to like get enough meaning from it to actually translate it. Um, with a little bit of help from Google Translate, I'm sure I could have figured it out. Uh, as you can see here, it was a limited edition print. This edition is limited to 1,000 copies, 100 copies signed on Dutch handmade paper numbered from one to 100. That is not where this volume comes from. This volume comes from the 150 copies on Verger d'Archet numbered from 100 to 250. So we're in the second batch with the volume that we have. 750 copies on handmade paper numbered from 251 to 1000. And as you can see, this one is numbered 222. So we are on Verger d'Archet, which I don't know what is. So how about we find out? Um, Arches paper. A brand of air-dried paper used by printers and watercolorists. Warm white color produced in hot pressed, cold pressed, and rough varieties. Made in the village of Arche in France. So it's, it's like, you know how champagne is champagne if it's from the Champagne region of France? 
Apparently, Arches paper is Arches paper because it comes from Arches in France. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, you can find publishers today who do special prints of books, collector's prints, signed and numbered, lettered editions, things like that. That's essentially the type of publication that this is, which today you're likely to get those special editions, those signed and numbered or lettered editions uh, after a book has already become popular. This numbered edition is the first printing. Um, the, the publisher asks the reader's indulgence for typographical errors unavoidable in the exceptional circumstances. So, exceptional circumstances. We will likely visit the Wikipedia page to get some basic primer information on what those exceptional circumstances are. Um, because I don't know. Um, this, so uh, numerous of my coworkers are people with degrees in literature, various types of literature, mostly uh, English literature or like British literature and um, American literature. Uh, I have one coworker who used to be a rare books salesman um, and so they know much more about this than I do, and um, it was recommended to me that I share this because they thought it was interesting. Um, and it is, and we will look more at this original volume in just a second. Um, for now, I'm going to put... this one in front of you all. As you can see, this one was published in three volumes. But I'm going to stick this up here just to kind of uh, fill the screen while I bring up that Wikipedia page so that we can learn what these extraordinary circumstances were. And then I'm going to show you why I know that our original copy has never been read. Okay, so it's just some basic, basic information, um, which is what you can rely on Wikipedia for, is basic primer information, general overview of a topic, not in-depth research, just familiarize me with it, let me learn a little bit so that I understand what I'm looking at or looking for, and have a basic understanding of a specific topic. Ulysses is a modernist novel by Irish writer James Joyce. It was first serialized in parts in the American journal The Little Review from March 1918 to December 1920 and then published in its entirety in Paris by Sylvia Beach on 2 February 1922, Joyce's 40th birthday. So that was two weeks ago that it turned 100 years old. Uh, it is considered one of the most important works of modernist literature and has been called a demonstration of and summation of the entire movement. According to Declan Kil uh, Kibberd, before Joyce, no writer of fiction had so foregrounded the process of thinking. Ulysses chronicles the appointments and encounters of the itinerant, itinerant Leopold Bloom in Dublin in the course of an ordinary day. 16 June 1904. Uh, Ulysses is the Latinized name of Odysseus, the hero of Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey, and the novel establishes a series of parallels between the poem and the novel, with structural correspondences between the characters and experiences of Bloom and Odysseus. Molly Bloom and Penelope and Stephen Daedalus and uh, Telemachus in addition to events and themes of the early 20th century context of modernism, Dublin, and Ireland's relationship to Britain. The novel is highly elusive and also imitates the styles of different periods of English literature. Since its publication, the book has attracted controversy and scrutiny, ranging, ranging from an obscenity trial in the United States in 1921 to protracted textual Joyce Wars. 
The novel's stream of consciousness technique, careful structuring, and experimental prose, replete with puns, parodies, and allusions, as well as its rich characterization and broad humor, have led it to be regarded as one of the greatest literary works in history. Joyce fans worldwide now celebrate 16 June as Bloomsday. All right, so I don't see anything here saying why it was so controversial to publish in the first place. I know that there, the obscenity trial in the U.S. delayed its publication here. <clears throat> the publication history of Ulysses is complex. There have been at least 18 editions and variations in different impressions of each edition. According to Joyce scholar Jack Dalton, the first edition of Ulysses contained over 2,000 errors. As subsequent editions attempted to correct these mistakes, they would often add more, due in part to the difficulty of separating non-authorial errors from Joyce's deliberate errors devised to challenge the reader. Notable editions include Paris, Shakespeare and Company, 1922, the one that we were just looking at, the first edition, um, uh, And then there was the Egoist Press edition from 1922, published in London, which was the first English edition, which I do not believe that we have. I think we only have the Paris edition for the 1922 date. Uh, yes. <clears throat> um, then there was New York, Two Worlds Publishing Company, 1929, which was the first New York, or the first U.S. edition, um, which I don't know. We may have that one. Nope. I do have a 1925, which is not on this list. Um, and then I have a 1930, and then I have a 1934, and a 1984. Um, so I have a couple of different editions, but, uh, and then I have the Gabler, which is the 1984. Hans Walter Gabler's 1984 edition was the most sustained attempt to produce a corrected text. But it, was re it received much criticism, most notably from John Kidd. Ch Kidd's main theoretical criticism is of Gabler's choice of a patchwork of manuscripts as his copy text. Uh, but this fault stems from an assumption of the Anglo-American tradition of scholarly editing rather than the blend of French and German editorial theories that actually lay behind Gabler's reasoning. The choice of a composite copy text is seen to be problematic in the eyes of some American editors who generally favor the first edition of any particular work as copy text. Less, so basically, uh, scholars got really mad at Gabler when he claimed he had a definitive edition. Uh, and so it's, it's a highly debated version, and we have it. So, uh, and indeed, the cover page that you are presently looking at is the cover page of volume three of that Gabler edition. But what I want to show you right now is why I know that our original 1922 Paris edition has never been read. Does anyone have any guesses as to why and how I would know that it has indeed never been read? I will entertain theories. Ouch. And like I said, I do need to stick this onto the foam here because the spine is in relatively poor condition. Uh, you can see the spine there. Uh, that is a good guess, Rykar, but not actually uh, accurate. Just here for coffee, you are 
much closer. Uh, let's see. I have such a tiny camera to try and share this with you. Let's spin this sideways, maybe? And I can show you... Oh, geez. The book is... It's big. Um, well, so as we look at this book, everything seems normal. Like the, the pages are just, just totally, absolutely, wonderfully normal. Uh, no way to know that this book has never been read. Um, here we are looking at page 125. It seems like a normal page. It is sideways or like on your screen because of the way I have the camera oriented at the moment. Uh, I could do this and it will be right side up again. Um, but you'll only get part of the page. Oh, can I zoom out? Am I zoomed all the way out? I am zoomed all the way out. It's a rather large volume. It's okay. But as I continue flipping through past 125, here we are at 131, uh, 133, 143, everything's still normal, 145. One forty seven, one forty nine, one fifty one. Everything's absolutely normal up to this point. You could read from page one to page one hundred and fifty one, one hundred and fifty two, one hundred and fifty three with no issue. But once you reach one hundred and fifty three, the pages aren't cut anymore. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to drop this piece of foam. I think I just need the one. Um, and that'll make it. <laughs> so starting with page 153, if you turn the page without tearing anything, you go from 153 to 156 and then 157 to 160, to 160, because the pages from this point forward are not cut, uh, meaning they are still attached at the top here, and it's not possible to turn the page. So somebody could potentially have read the rest of the book by tenting them open and, and looking in, but that's a lot of book to read that way. And, um, I don't think it reasonable to assume that anyone has ever actually done that. So pay, uh, uh, copy number 222 of the initial run of 1000 from Shakespeare and Company in Paris, France has never been read. And I say that with somewhere like, you know, 97% uh, certainty based on the fact that from page 130 or 153 on, the pages are not cut. Um, and therefore, I know at least past page 153, it, it likely has never been read. Um, so this is, this is one um, item that gets used for instruction here often. Uh, our uh, former rare bookseller who does a lot of our instruction um, Honestly, when I went looking for this, I didn't even look on the shelf. I just went to his office and asked if he had it because that's how often he uses this volume in instruction. Um, but so it's really nice. It's got the little, the little rough edges that we've talked about before on stream that I cannot recall exactly what that is uh, called. But yeah, as, as you go into the book, all of these pages are just not cut. They're just attached at the top there, and therefore it would be an extremely difficult book to actually read. Um, not because of the content of the book, but because of the physical structure of the volume. Um, I'm going to close it back up again because as you can see, it is somewhat fragile. The, the binding here has decayed um, and the little leaves 
um, are coming apart. So I'm going to be gentle with it. I'm going to stick it back in its box. Um, and we will actually read excerpts from uh, one of the other versions, which, uh, as we learned from the Wikipedia article that we were just glancing at, means the text will be slightly different <laughs> in what we actually read. But I don't think that that will be of too big a concern. Um, so we have this gorgeous original edition from Paris. Um, the next one that we have, uh, date-wise, is a volume from 1925. And as you can see, it's, um, it's tied with cotton tape uh, because it, too, is decaying somewhat. And so it is tied to keep everything together. So let me untie it and we can glance inside. This will also not be the, <clears throat> the edition that we actually end up reading from just because of its fragile condition. But <clears throat> like you can see here, it doesn't look like it actually even has a back cover. Although this is a paperback from 1925. Uh, there is no hard cover on this, so I do think this is actually the back cover. It's just a blank piece of paper that can, that compromise, comprises the back cover. Um, and as you can see, it looks like maybe there's a little bit of paint on the cover here. I'm not sure how well you can make that out, but just between the Y and the S there, Above them, it looks like there's a little bit of white paint. Um, there is what appears to be a coffee ring, a coffee cup ring in the middle of the cover there. So this, is, this has lived a little bit, this issue from 1925. Um, and let's see. Uh, there's a name just on the back here of the cover handwritten, it looks like in pencil, and it appears to say Miles Horton. Um, let's see what this says. Uh, oh, wow, it's coming apart here. Um, I, I'm uncertain. This seems like it was probably a proper name. The best I can make out is T-R-I-E-S-T-E, -E, uh, Trieste, but I have absolutely no idea whether that's what's actually written there um, without some context. Um, it's dated June 6, 1926, so about a year after publication. It says, picked up in a little shop for about 60 pounds. That seems expensive to me. Um, but that does look like an L, and the best I can make out is that that would be pounds. If anybody is more familiar with British currency from 1925, please feel free to let me know if that's actually saying 60 pounds or if that is something else, uh, because I'm uncertain. Um, that is something that if I was truly interested in, in knowing it and needed to know it for research, that is something that I would probably have to dig into and research, find somebody who was an expert on currency from uh, that time period and figure out what this notation actually meant. Um, I'm not going to go and do that research myself, but if there's somebody in chat who knows, I would appreciate you uh, sharing. Uh, and Kira says um, that she believes that it is pounds. Also, hi, Kira. Um, and it's a location in Italy. Okay, Trieste. Italy. Um, Pence at the time would have been written as a D. So Lira, and that makes much more sense just here for coffee. So if it's Trieste, uh, June 6, 1926, Trieste in Italy, um, which, yeah, Trieste is a city in Italy um, that is located... So I did read the spelling properly. Um, 
Oh, wow. It is up. So Tresta is not on the main boot of Italy. It's up around past Venice. There's a little peninsula that dips down off of the western side of Slovenia and the northwestern part of Croatia and just dips out into the Adriatic Sea. Um, and Trieste is at the very top of that peninsula, basically just touching onto the southwestern part of Slovenia. Um, so it appears that whoever got this picked it up in a little shop for about 60 lira in Trieste, Italy on June 6, 1926. We have solved it. And uh, 60 lira, hi Scraff. Um, 60 lira makes a lot more sense. 60 pounds would have been in incredibly expensive. Um, 60 lira makes a lot more sense for the value of a book. Um, so Scraff, the book, uh, I haven't actually read it, so uh, Kira can probably give you more, but um, the book, I will read, this is from the Wikipedia page, uh, chronicles the appointments and encounters of the itinerant Leopold Bloom in Dublin in the course of an ordinary day, 16 June 1904. Um, Ulysses being the Latinized name of Odysseus, uh, the hero of Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey, and the novel establishes a series of parallels between the poem and the novel. So it includes um, a story that is very much commentary on the relationship between Ireland and England, but is also told as an allegory using the framework of Homer's The Odyssey as structure for the story. Um, and, and so plot wise, if you're familiar with the plot of the Odyssey, to my understanding, you would basically be familiar with the plot of Ulysses, uh, general plot points, broad arc at least. Um, but the, the book itself details a single day in the life of a man in, uh, Ireland. Um, UK currency was pounds at the time. Librea solidi denari. L was apparently the symbol for Italian lira. Thank you, Be Right UK. Um, oh, and we have a we have a description here on the interior page here, and uh, this book is is in quite fragile condition. So. Uh, Ulysses by James Joyce. Um, the What's pasted in here lists it as $3.50. Uh, Nothing new needs to be said about Ulysses, which for over a dozen years has been regarded by most of the best judges as one of the great books in the English language. Now, this article is not dated. It's pasted into a volume that was printed in 1925, which was three years after the first printing. But we do know that the story started being printed in serial form in 1918. Um, so it is possible... Nope, it's not possible that this article that's pasted in is from the same year that this book was published. The modern meaning for uh, pounds, shillings, and pence. Gotcha. Um, regarded by most of the best judges as one of the great books in the English language and one of the greatest books produced in any language during the 20th century. Um, I'm getting a little bit of shadow on the page. I'm just going to turn up the overheads and see if I can eliminate that shadow real quick. I like the more cozy lighting, but for this, I just felt like I was getting too much shadow from the little uh, camera holder. Uh, yes, the return of the soldier from the Trojan War is, is the Odyssey. Um, and we'll start 
like I, I am gonna read the beginning of the book. Like I'll read as an excerpt, we'll start and, and read the beginning of the book, which I'm told is a good portion to read. It was suggested to me that I just start at the beginning uh, when I said I might want to read an excerpt. So the $3.50 price quoted on the paper would probably help narrow when the quote was timed. Yes, 60 pounds suggests to 3,000 pounds or so now. Oh my gosh. Um, As a complete picture of life for 24 hours in Dublin, it contains, however, certain elements that have disturbed the authorities, with the result that its publication and distribution in the United States was forbidden. By the enlightened decision of Judge Woolsey, this absurd officiousness has now been done away with, and the book may be circulated in America like any other distinguished classic. So, um, I don't know the exact time that the I don't know the exact date that the ruling was issued allowing it to be published in the U.S., uh, but the first edition published in the U.S. was 1929. Uh, the new edition contains a preface written especially for it by Mr. Joyce and the whole text of Judge Woolsey's decision which deserves to stand as a landmark in American literary history. So what's interesting here is it talks about a new edition <clears throat> that is published that includes the text of the legal decision allowing it to be published in the United States. And I have that edition right here. And we will look at that in just a second uh, because it actually talks about the controversy, why it wasn't allowed to be published in the U.S. Um, I will not read the legal decision because it is quite lengthy, but um, that is the edition that I'm holding in my hand right now that is being talked about in this little article here. Um, here we have a newspaper article inserted. This newspaper article is from the New York Times, October 10th, 1962. Sylvia Beach, 75, first to publish Joyce's Ulysses Dies in Paris. Uh, so she apparently died in 1962. Book pirated in U.S. Uh, Miss Beach suffered a considerable loss in, of business when ju Judge John M. Woolsey in federal court in New York handed down an opinion in 1933 that Ulysses was not obscene in the ordinary sense of the word. The book had been pirated in the United States and later was published legitimately with no profit to the pioneering Miss Beach. Ah, okay, so this one is 1925. This is the Egoist Press edition, but not the first edition of the e Egoist Press. Is that what I'm seeing? No, 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 it's not. Um, this appears to just be a reprint of the Shakespeare and Company from three years later and much smaller. Um, aha! This is the sixth printing of the Shakespeare and Company edition. And is in somewhat more fragile condition than the 1922 edition, but also seems to have been used and loved. And like we saw the coffee ring on the cover. Um, as you can see, it's got some staining on some of the pages inside. Um, Unlike the other issue that we could tell had clearly never been read uh, because of the uncut pages, this one seems to have at least had use up to page seven because page seven has staining on it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, put this one away, see if I can tie it up a little bit. The first authorized U.S. edition would have been mid-1930s. So the f according to the Wikipedia page, which I will again say, good for general information, not necessarily authoritative, um, the Wikipedia page had said that the first edition published in the U.S. was 1929, which is why I was seeing that date. Um, but it's possible that that was an unauthorized edition. The initial pirate editions were almost direct copies of the Shakespeare Press. 
Gotcha. 1929 was a pirate edition. Thank you, Just Here for Coffee. Just tying it back up inside the little cotton tape here. Um, so the next one that we have, that was 1925. The next one I have is 1930. We are going to open this one up and take a look at it. It looks visually like the 1922 edition, only smaller. Uh, it's got the blue cover and everything. Basically, it was banned from serial publication circa 1920 to uh, 1934. Uh, Kira, can you clarify? Um, banned from serial publication, what do you mean by that? Because it was published initially in pieces in a magazine starting in 1918. Um, so I'm getting confused on the dates because the serial publication I thought started in 1918 and then the first full volume was 1922. but also I did not study literature and may be getting confused on terminology. So if you want to clarify, that'd be lovely. Um, all right, so this is from the collection of Dayton Kohler, uh, 1931. I have no idea who Dayton Kohler is, but there's a little sticker on the inside here that says from the collection of Dayton Kohler or Keeler, I'm not certain of how this person pronounced it. Um, so this is 1930. These pages are much more acidic. They've yellowed quite a bit and are somewhat fragile on their own. Uh, this appears to be the 11th printing <clears throat> of the Shakespeare and Company edition. I don't know how well used this one is, but we have it. But the one that I want to look at is the next one. And as you can see, this one's had some repair. You can see there's some paper tape on here. Um, if I was to zoom in, and since I say those words, maybe I should zoom in, you should be able to see there's, um, you can see the texture in the tape itself. Um, it's woven like it is cloth. It's actual cloth. Um, and that has been used to repair this and reattach the cover as well as to reinforce the edge of the cover along the, s the side and the bottom. But the one that I want to look at is the next one um, that's in a box here that is going to give us some history of the controversy as well as the text of the actual legal case, um, which we saw mentioned in that article. Uh, let me just tie this one back up real quick. Is there anybody who has actually read Ulysses uh, in, in one of the chats? Keeler was a literature professor at Virginia Tech. Thank you, Fluidan. And it could be Kohler, it could be Keeler. There are, I've, I've heard that spelling pronounced multiple different ways, K-O-H-L-E-R. Um, so I do not know how they pronounced their name. <clears throat> so as you can see, this is inside of a little box, uh, a, a sh like shell box, um, which is the same kind of box that most of our pulp uh, magazines are, are housed in. Um, this one has a book in it. 
And as you can see, uh, we do not have that classic blue color or blue cover. Um, oh, I need to zoom back out. I, apo I apologize. James Joyce Ulysses. Uh, you can see it's got a cloth cover. Uh, it's got the black and red for the title. Um, the sticker in here it says Tench Francis Tillman. Specialit Agricolam. I don't know the middle word, so. But uh, James Joyce, Ulysses, uh, we have a foreword, which I am going to read from this book because it's gonna give us some information. This is Ulysses by James Joyce, first American edition, published by Random House, New York, 1934, copyright 1918, 1919, 1920, by Margaret Caroline Anderson, uh, copyright 1934, by the Modern Library Incorporated, printed and bound in the USA by H. Wolf, New York City, designed by Ernst Reichel. <clears throat> and I can look up the Latin if we want. Um, I did take more Latin than I took French, but it's also been more than 20 years since I took Latin. Um, and this one is also in poor condition with the cover actually not attached, uh, but that won't stop us. Where'd the thing go? Did I? Where was that? Aha! <laughs> I'm losing it. Uh, space. Elite. Uh, Agricolam. Ah, okay, it means hope sustains the farmer. And it was a, it was tied to the uh, Tillman family. Yeah, it's hope sustains the farmer and it was uh, apparently the, the family motto for the Tillmans. Uh, and apparently Tench Francis Tillman um, must have owned this book. Right, so as you can see, not actually attached, the cover here. Probably part of why it's in a clamshell box. But let us see, because this has a foreword that is going to talk about the legal status of the book. And I think I can afford to do, yeah, that'll work. <clears throat> the New Deal in the Law of Letters is here. George Woolsey has exonerated Ulysses of the charge of obscenity handing down an opinion that bids fair to become a major event in the history of the struggle for free expression. Joyce's masterpiece for the circulation of, uh, for the circulation, yeah, that is what, sorry, I apologize. Joyce's manuscript, for the circulation of which people have been branded criminals in the past, may now freely enter this country. It would be difficult to overestimate the importance of Judge Woolsey's decision. For decades, the censors have fought to emasculate literature. They have tried to set up the sensibilities of the uh, prudery ridden as a criterion for society, have sought to reduce the reading matter of adults to the level of adolescents and subnormal persons. Um, 
Yeah, I take a little issue with that phrasing and have nurtured evasions and sanctimonies. Um, so essentially, honestly, an argument that is still going on today with a lot of um, discussion of banning books in libraries, of removing titles from uh, availability based on the content of the title. Um, there was a law passed not too long ago um, and my brain is not going to recall where. One of you may uh, recall where, but there was a, uh, a law passed essentially banning all sexual content in books. And, and that was the phrasing. It included, it, it was targeted at LGBTQ content, but the phrasing included and all sexual content meaning basically every romance novel, the Bible, um, human anatomy books, as well as all of the LGBTQ content that they were actually interested in, uh, falls under that law and the libraries would not receive public funding if they continued to include copies of those items on their shelves. Um, but. The Bible includes sexual content, so the people that were trying to remove certain content based on their religious beliefs are also removing their own religious text because of the way that the law was worded. Um, oh yes, Oklahoma. Thank you, Lord Portico. It was in o Oklahoma. I was just reading about it yesterday, which is why I remembered it. Uh, you wonder how common the Tillman name is. There are some Tillmans. Um, yeah, Hannah, and I'm not sure if it's, I, I'm not sure if they would be related because this Tillman is spelled differently. Uh, this Tillman is not T-I-L-L-M-A-N, although could be related. This Tillman is T-I-L-G-H-M-A-N. But so here we are, 1934, talking about um, this book, which had been previously banned, finally being made available. Um, this book had not even been allowed to be published in the U.S. because it was considered obscenity. <clears throat> the Ulysses case marks a turning point. It is a body blow for the censors. The necessity for hypocrisy and circumlocution in literature has been eliminated. Writers need no longer seek refuge in euphemisms. They may now describe basic human functions without fear of the law. The Ulysses case has a threefold significance. The definition and criteria of obscenity have long vexed us. Judge Woolsey has given us a formula which is lucid, rational, and practical. In doing so, he has not only charted a labyrinthine branch of the law, but has written an opinion which raises him to the level of former Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes as a master of judicial uh, ju juridical prose. His service to the cause of free letters has been of no lesser moment. But perhaps his greatest service has been to the community. The, pre the precedent he has established will do much to rescue the mental, pa uh, the mental pabulum of the public from the censors who have striven to convert it into treacle and will help to make it the strong, provocative fair it ought to be. The first week of December 1933 will go down in history for two repeals, that of prohibition and that of the legal compulsion for squeamishness in literature. It is not inconceivable but that these two have been closely interlinked in the recent past and that sex repressions found vent in intemperance. Uh, that sex repressions found vent in intemperance. At any rate, we may now imbibe freely of the contents of bottles and forthright books. It may well be that in the future the repeal of the sex taboo in letters will prove to be of the greater importance. Perhaps the intolerance which closed our distilleries was the intolerance which decreed that basic human functions had to be treated in books in a furtive, leering, roundabout manner. Happily, both of these have now been repudiated. Uh, it would take 
a little bit longer before they were relaxed in movies and television, and it would take until the 1990s until uh, LGBTQ topics could be addressed in movies and television without being uh, shown in a negative light um, because of like the legal decision here was only about print books. Um, <laughs> yes, Portico, we are doing lots of uh, lots of law stuff. Um, United States versus one book called Ulysses. Wikipedia article. Let me drop that link in the other chat real quick. Um, just give me one second. Oops, I'm hitting the wrong buttons. Go away. Oh. Banning books is so dumb. If you find a book offensive, then don't read it. But the thing is, people want to impose their morality on other people. Um, I think this is a perfectly valid discussion to have since we're broadcasting from a library that would prefer to make information available to people who are seeking it. Um, that is sort of the mission of libraries, is to help you find the information that you are seeking. Um, we don't really inquire into why you want the information. Uh, we are here to help you find it and help you figure out how to find it. So uh, you're about to say that at least surely there can be only one ten, uh, Tench t uh, Tillman. Uh, then you looked it up and confirmed there are at least four of them. You're assuming the Tench Tillman who was in the Revolutionary War did not also buy Ulysses. Probably not the same one. Um, this Tench Tillman's middle name was Francis. In the U.S. we had to move on from the I know it when I see it definition of obscenity before we could figure out how to do audiovisual media. Indeed. Um, and And... The reason, um, oh, what was it called? The Hayes Code? Uh, so the Hayes Code was the beginning of it, and that ran from 1934 to 1968, affecting um, visual, uh, audiovisual media. But um, the unofficial like blacklist for LGBT uh, content persisted into the 90s. Like the effect of the Hays Code prohibitions on LGBT topics um, lasted into the mid 90s. Um, and you can see it reflected in uh, the way shows like Star Trek Deep Space Nine were implemented, where the only time LGBT topics were actually interacted with in that show is when they were the uh, evil mirror universe version of the characters. Um, and so that was about the time where sometimes it was beginning to be allowed to be seen in a better light with shows like Will and Grace and things like that. Uh, but the effects of the morality that led to the banning of Ulysses were felt and, and into the 90s for sure in regard to our um, audiovisual media in the United States. And uh, depending on how you look at it, are still being felt today with the way that some of these topics are engaged with. Um. <clears throat> kind of name you think would be unique. Uh, well, if it was a name given to someone today, it likely would be unique, Key Squared. This stream is brought to you by Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. <laughs> Thank you, Portico. Indeed, we are not sponsored by Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, but it is likely relevant reading if you're at all interested. Um, <laughs> let's see, where was I? Um, the Ulysses case is the culmination of a protracted and stubborn struggle against the censors dating back to the victory over the New York Vice Society in the Mademoiselle de Maupin case in 1922. 
coming in logical sequence after the Well of Loneliness case, the Dennett case, the cases involving Dr. Stopes's books, the Casanova's homecoming case, and Frankie and Johnny, the Frankie and Johnny case, and the God's Little Acre case, all of which have served to liberalize the law of obscenity. The victory of Ulysses is a fitting climax to the statutory for salutary forward march of our courts. Under the Ulysses case, it should henceforth be impossible for the censors legally to sustain an attack against any book of artistic integrity, no matter how frank and forthright it may be. We have traveled a long way from the days of Bowdler and Mrs. Grundy and Comstock. We may well rejoice over the result. Morris L. Ernst, New York, December 11th, 1933. <laughs> yes, stream not actually sponsored by the United States Code. Hey, U.S. Code, sponsor me. Uh, <laughs> and then, following that forward, they print the opinion from the legal case as preface to the novel itself. The monumental decision of the United States District Court rendered December 6, 1933 by Honorable John M. Woolsey lifting the ban on Ulysses. <laughs> um, I'm not going to read the legal opinion. Uh, but I, I, let me read the very beginning here. There's some italicized text that <laughs> this is how you cite a source. You just print the entire thing. No, this is not how you cite a source. Um, if you are curious about how to cite a legal opinion, uh, both MLA and APA citation styles tell you to use Blue Book, uh, which can be quite confusing because then you have to learn Blue Book, but is not impossible and your librarian can help you. Uh, on cross motions for a decree in the libel of confiscation, supplemented by a stipulation herein after described, brought by the United States against the book Ulysses by James Joyce under section 305 of the Tariff Act of 1930, Title 19 United States Code section 1305 on the ground that the book is obscene within the meaning of that section and hence is not importable into the United States but is subject to seizure, forfeiture, and confiscation and destruction. J. Woolsey. The motion for a decree dismissing the libel herein is granted, and consequently, of course, the government's motion for a decree of forfeiture and destruction is denied. Accordingly, a decree dismissing the libel without costs may be entered herein. 1. The practice followed in this case is in accordance with the suggestion made by me in the case of United States versus one book entitled Contraception. 51F. Uh, and is as follows, after issue was joined by the filing of the claimant's answer to the libel for forfeiture against Ulysses, a stipulation was made between the United States Attorney's Office, Office and the attorneys for the claimant providing, one, that the book Ulysses should be deemed to have been annexed to and to have become part of the libel just as if it had been incorporated in its entirety therein. <clears throat> Two, that the parties waived their right to a trial by jury. Three, that each party agreed to move for decree in its favor. Four, that on such cross motions, the court might decide all the questions of law and fact involved and render a general finding thereon. Five, that on the decision of such motions, the decree of the court might be entered as if it were a decree after trial. It seems to me that a procedure of this kind is highly appropriate in libels for the confiscation of books such as this. It is an especially ad advantageous procedure in the instant case because on the account of the length of Ulysses and the difficulty of reading it, a jury trial would have been an extremely unsatisfactory, if not an almost impossible method of dealing with it. The book is dense. We can't have a jury trial because the jurors will not be able to read and understand the book. This is in the opinion of the judge. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, Portico, they use Blue Book. Both MLA and APA use Blue Book for legal citations. <laughs> Reference to Bodler harks back to the 18th century publication um, is a censored Shakespeare, apt considering the publisher of Ulysses, also the origin of the verb to Bodlerize. 
Two, I have read Ulysses once in its entirety, and I have read those passages of which the government particularly complains several times. In fact, for many weeks, my spare time has been devoted to the consideration of the decision which my duty would require me to make in this matter. Ulysses is not an easy book to read or to understand, but there has been much written about it, and in order to properly approach the consideration of it, it is advisable to read a number of other books which have now become its satellites. The study of Ulysses is, therefore, a heavy task. Three, the reputation of Ulysses in the literary world, however warranted my taking such time as was, as was necessary to enable me to satisfy myself as to the intent with which the book was written. For, of course, in any case where a book is claimed to be obscene, it must first be determined whether the intent with which it was written was what is called, according to the usual phrase, pornographic. That is, written for the purpose of exploiting obscenity. Note that having a jury trial where the physical book is a defendant is, well, complicated. Yes, um, we do in fact have a lawyer in chat, which, uh, and in fact a law professor in chat, uh, which is helping <laughs> for today's topic. Thank you, Portico. Um, if the conclusion is that the book is pornographic, that is the end of the inquiry and forfeiture must follow. But in Ulysses, in spite of its unusual frankness, I do not detect anywhere the leer of the sen sensualist. I hold, therefore, that it is not pornographic. For, in writing Ulysses, Joyce sought to make a serious experiment in a new, if not wholly novel, literary genre. He takes persons of the lower middle class living in Dublin in 1904 and seeks not only to describe what they did on a certain day early in June of that year as they went about the city bent on their usual occupations, but also to tell what many of them thought about the while. Joyce has attempted, it seems to me with astonishing success, to show how the screen of consciousness with its ever-shifting kaleidoscopic impressions carries as it were on the plastic palimpsest, not only what is in the focus of each man's observation of the actual things about him, but also in a penumbral zone residua of past impressions, some recent and some drawn up by association from the domain of the subconscious. He shows how each of these impressions affects the life and behavior of the character which he is describing. Actually, this legal opinion reads very, I, I'm finding it very interesting, which is why I'm still reading it. Um, <clears throat> what he seeks to get is not unlike the result of a double, or if that is possible, a multiple exposure on a cinema film, which would give a clear foreground with a background visible but somewhat blurred and out of focus in varying, varying degrees. The lawyer, or sorry, the judge who's writing this legal opinion is doing literary analysis in the legal opinion to explain the artistic purpose with which James Joyce wrote the novel. I find that fascinating. To convey by words an effect which obviously lends itself more appropriately, more appropriately to a graphic technique accounts, it seems to me, for much of the obscurity which meets a reader of Ulysses. It is and, and it also explains another aspect of the book, which I have further to consider, namely Joyce's sincerity in his honest effort to show exactly how the minds of his characters operate. If Joyce did not attempt to be honest in developing the technique which he has adopted in Ulysses, the result would be psychologically misleading and thus unfaithful to the chosen technique. Such an attitude would be artistically inexcusable. This judge is ruling on matters of what is artistic versus not and what is demanded by faithful adherence to artistic craft. Fascinating. It is because Joyce has been loyal to his technique and has not funked it necessary, funked its necessary implications that is the word. It is because Joyce has been loyal to his technique and has not funked its necessary implications, but has honestly attempted to tell fully what his characters think about, that he has been the subject of so many attacks, 
and that his purpose has been so often misunderstood and misrepresented. For his attempt sincerely and honestly to realize his objective has required him incidentally to use certain words which are generally considered dirty words and has led at times to what many think is a too poignant preoccupation with sex in the thoughts of his characters. The words which are criticized as dirty are old Saxon words known to almost all men, and I venture to many women, and are such words as would be naturally and habitually used, I believe, by the types of folk whose life, physical and mental, Joyce is seeking to describe. In respect of the recurrent re uh, emergence of the theme of sex in the minds of his characters, it must always be remembered that his locale was Celtic and his season, Spring. Whether or not what... Did the judge just say that the Irish are horny in springtime? Special note, because the lawyers have agreed to having the court decide the issue as a motion after trial, it places the judge in the role of a finder of fact, meaning that he is required to use his own intellectual judgment as to what art is in this instance as applied to the pornography law. That is, thank you for that clarification, Portico. Um, I find it utterly fascinating. Uh, hello, Energ Energesia to Espanol. Welcome from Spain, or welcome from Virginia to you in Spain. Um, it's good to have you here. And, and yes, okay, you all saw it as well. This judge uh, just said that the Irish are horny in springtime, uh, that his locale was Celtic and his season spring. Whether or not one enjoys such a technique as Joyce uses in, is a matter of taste <clears throat> on which disagreement or argument is futile, uh, but to subject that technique to the standards of some other technique seems to me to be a little short of uh, absurd. And um, Energesia, uh, if you're just joining us, we are presently looking at an edition of James Joyce's Ulysses that was published in 1934. It is the first US edition. Um, and as preface to it, there is a copy of the legal opinion that finally allowed it to be published because prior to this legal opinion, the novel was deemed to be obscene by uh, the US and was not allowed to be published or distributed in this country. Um, and so the, we're, we're glancing at the judge's legal opinion and then I'm going to read an excerpt from the novel. Um. <clears throat> Accordingly, I hold that Ulysses is a sincere and honest book, and I think that the criticisms of it are entirely disposed of by its rationale. Furthermore, Ulysses is an amazing tour de force when one considers the success which has been in the main achieved with such a difficult objective as Joyce set for himself. As I have stated, Ulysses is not an easy book to read. It is brilliant and dull, intelligible and obscure by turns. In many places it seems to me disgusting, but although it, contain, uh, although it contains, as I have mentioned above, many words usually considered dirty, I have not found anything that I consider to be dirt for dirt's sake. Each word of the book contributes like a bit of mosaic to the detail of the picture which Joyce is seeking to construct for his readers. If one does not wish to associate with such folk as Joyce describes, that is one's own choice. In, uh, in order to avoid indirect contact with them, one may not wish to read Ulysses. Uh, that is quite understandable. But when such a real artist in words, as Joyce undoubtedly is, seeks to draw a true picture of the lower middle class in a European city, ought it to be impossible for the American public legally to see that picture? So I love that in his opinion here, he is just saying, if you don't want to encounter the language that Joyce is using, and if you don't want to encounter his descriptions of the sexual thoughts of the characters in his book, don't read the book. That doesn't mean, just because you don't want to encounter them, doesn't mean that the book should not be available. And I think that that legal opinion um, is just as valid today when we're looking at the book banning attempts that are happening uh, in, in modern context of, if you're not happy with the content of the book, don't read the book, 
but just because you're not happy with it does not mean that it should not be available to others. If you don't like it, don't read it. Oh goodness, can we bring this judge back? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Um. <laughs> Oh, and I will also mention uh, for any viewers who are unaware uh, or who may have joined, I am live on two different channels, so there's chat in two different channels. Um, let's see. To answer this question, it is not sufficiently sufficient merely to find, as I have found above, that Joyce did not write Ulysses with what is commonly called pornographic intent. I must endeavor to apply a more objective standard to his book in order to determine its effect in the result, irrespective of the intent with which it was written. The statute under which the libel is filed only denounces, in so far as we are here concerned, the importation into the United States of any foreign er, from any foreign country of any obscene book. Section 305 of the Tariff Act of 1930, Title 19, United States Code, Section 1305. It does not marshal against books the spectrum of condemnatory adjectives found commonly in laws dealing with matters of this kind. I am therefore only required to determine whether Ulysses is obscene within the legal definition of that word. The meaning of the word obscene as legally defined by the courts is tending to stir the sex impulses or to lead to sexually impure and lustful thoughts. So, the specific code section that applies here does not have a list of words that are banned, as we are familiar with from the radio and television codes that are still in effect today, uh, that you may, um, if you want to hear some humorous uh, take on it, I believe um, George Carlin, the comedian, has an entire routine about the seven words you can't say on television. Uh, there was no list, so it's just the legal definition, and the legal definition says tending to stir the sex impulses or to lead to sexually impure and lustful thoughts. Yes, George Carlin. Okay. Refrains from the lecture about what the Supreme Court did recently that makes all of this standard incredibly more complicated in the context of school libraries. Yes, Portico. Winter Draws On was banned by the BBC comedy censors? Oh my, I, I, I don't know what that phrase would mean. Um, Cause that has absolutely no sexual meaning to me. A oh, winter draw, draws, draws being a pronunciation of the word drawers, meaning underwear. Wow. Wow. Okay. Uh, so then we have a citation. Whether a particular book would tend to excite such impulses and thoughts must be tested by the court's opinion as to its effect on a person with average sex instincts. 1933, average sex instincts. That phrasing implies that there is a spectrum of sexual feeling among people and that some people have a lesser libido and some people have a more active libido. And this is something that we know today when we're talking about sexuality and, and the spectrum of sexuality that goes from asexuality to hypersexuality. Um, 1933, just the phrase uh, that is used here about average sex instincts implies the existence of a spectrum of actual, like, sexual feeling. Our American prudery, prudery is a British import. Thanks, Henry VIII. <laughs> um... 
uh, what the French would call le homme moyen sensual, who plays in this branch of legal inquiry the same role of hypothetical reagent as does the reasonable man in the law of torts and the man learned in the art on questions of invention in patent law. So the reasonable man is a standard in tort law um, whereby uh, consideration of something... So most people are familiar with the American concept of beyond a reasonable doubt or things like that. Well, uh, that, as I understand it, and Portico, feel free to correct me, um, reasonable doubt would be doubt held by a reasonable man. I could be completely off base there, but a reasonable man would be the average person. Uh, like, would the average person, would a reasonable person uh, have an understanding of such and such? Um, and I believe that I'm getting that right, but uh, also as soon as I started talking about it, I began to, dis to, to uh, doubt whether I could express it in terms that would be acceptable to someone who had studied law. So feel free to correct me and put text in chat that I can read out loud to clarify. Best to separate the beyond a reasonable doubt standard from the reasonable person in tort law. Thank you. <laughs> and also Philip is here. I have two lawyers in chat now. Um, reasonable doubt means you can have doubts that a person is guilty as long as those doubts are not reasonable. Gotcha. Okay, but uh, and that is com a completely different use of the term reasonable from the reasonable person. So please uh, explain to me in terminology that I can read to provide clarification for the audience uh, what a reasonable person would be in tort law. Um, because that is the, the approach that this judge is using to an analyze whether uh, the average person would be aroused by reading this book in order to make his decision. What a person calls reasonable may differ from others, I think effectively means those who agree with me. <laughs> that was not from one of the lawyers, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, this is why I'm asking the lawyers. Uh, where was I? The risk involved in the use of such a reagent arises from the inherent tendency of the trier of facts, however fair he may intend to be, to make his reagent too much subservient to his own idiosyncrasies. Here I have attempted to avoid this, if possible, and to make my reagent herein more objective than he might otherwise be. Uh, by adopting the following course. After I have made my decision in regard to the aspect of Ulysses now under consideration, I checked my impressions with two friends of mine who, in my opinion, answered to the above stated requirement for my reagent, meaning of average sex instincts. Uh, all right, so for torts, when we measure whether or not somebody somebody's actions were reasonable from the point of view of a person of ordinary care and sensibilities, placed in the situation of the person doing the tort. A reasonable person is a person with a like skill set and experience and like physical disabilities, uh, how prudent that hypothetical person would act in the same circumstances. Okay. And I think that makes sense. Um, if you are still confused after me having read those things, feel free to do your own research on uh, what a reasonable person is in tort law, um, because I'm sure that there are things out there that will help you to learn that. Um, <clears throat> but so basically, in order to make sure he wasn't just comparing it against his own sensibilities, he also got two other people that he was aware of, that he felt to have average sex instincts, uh, to also weigh in on uh, what their thoughts were. Uh, these literary assessors, as I might properly describe them, were called on separately and neither knew that I was consulting the other. They are men whose opinion on literature and on life I value most highly. They had both read Ulysses and, of course, were wholly unconnected with this cause. Uh, without letting either of my assessors know what my decision was, I gave to each of them the legal definition of obscene and asked whether, in his opinion, Ulysses was obscene within that definition. 
I was interested to find that they both agreed with my opinion that reading Ulysses in its entirety as a book must be read on such a test as this uh, did not tend to excite sexual impulses or lustful thoughts, but that its net effect on them was only that of a somewhat tragic and very powerful commentary on the inner lives of men and women. The judge found their own mini-jury. <laughs> This would be considered incredibly naughty today. It is only with the normal person that the law is concerned. Such a test as I have described, therefore, is the only proper test of obscenity in the case of a book like Ulysses, which is a sincere and serious attempt to devise a new literary method for the observation and description of mankind. I am quite aware that owing to some of its scenes, Ulysses is a rather strong draft to ask some sensitive, though normal persons to take. But my considered opinion, after long reflection, is that whilst in many places the effect of Ulysses on the reader undoubtedly is somewhat emetic, nowhere does it tend to be an aphrodisiac. Ulysses may, therefore, be admitted into the United States. And then we have a letter from Mr. Joyce to the publisher, reprinted in this edition by permission of the author. Normal person. Yes, um, there was some terminology in there that we would prefer not to have used today. It took until 1936 that England lifted the ban? That, I'd be interested in why. Uh, and I would also be curious as to whether there was some anti-Irish bias in uh, informing the English decision. Just men and women, so the rest of us are our, on our own. There was a, a, a phrasing in here earlier um, that was also problematic in the way that it talked about, uh, I think the phrase was deficient people. Um, so there's definitely some language in there that, uh, that we would prefer not to use today. Um, Then we did it all again for Lady Chatterley's Lover. <laughs> I believe you. Uh, I'm not familiar with that one either. Supreme Court doesn't come up with a working definition of obscenity that includes community standards until Miller v. California in 1973. Interesting. All right, so I'm going to read this letter from James Joyce. Hopefully it's not super long, because I would like to actually read an excerpt or read the beginning of the book for you all. Uh, it does look like this letter is not terribly long, so we will read the letter and then I will uh, pull out, we've got two more editions to glance at and I will read some from the actual story. Dear Mr. Cerf, I thank you very much for your message conveyed to me by Mr. Robert Castor. You asked me for details of the story of the publication of Ulysses, and since you are determined to fight for its legalization in the United States and to publish what will be the only authentic edition there, I think it just as well to tell you the history of its publication in Europe and the complications which followed it in America, although I was under the impression that they were already well known. As it is, however, they have, been, they have given my book in print a life of its own. Habent sua fata libelli. <clears throat> One second, I will Google it because my Latin is not strong enough to translate that without Googling it. Uh... <clears throat> Books have their own destinies, apparently is what that means. You are surely well, and well aware of the difficulties I found in publishing anything I wrote from the very first volume of prose I attempted to publish, Dubliners. Publishers and printers alike seem to agree among themselves, no matter how divergent their points of view were in other matters, not to publish anything of mine as I wrote it. No less than 22 publishers and printers read the manuscript of Dubliners, and when at last it was printed, some very kind person bought out the entire edition and had it burnt in Dublin. A new and private auto-de-fe. 
Without the collaboration of the Egoist Press Limited London, conducted by Miss Harriet Weaver, the portrait of an artist as a young man might still be in manuscript. You can well imagine that when I came to Paris in the summer 1920 with the voluminous manuscript of Ulysses, I stood even slenderer chances of finding a publisher on account of its suppression after the publication of the 11th episode in the little review conducted by Miss Margaret Anderson and Miss Jane Heap. These two editors were, as you probably remember, prosecuted at the instance of some society and as a result further publication in serial form was prohibited. The existing copies were confiscated and I believe the fingerprints of the two ladies were taken. The completed manuscript, however, was offered to one of your colleagues on the American market, but I greatly doubt that he even took the trouble to glance at it. My friend, Mr. Ezra Pound, and good luck, brought me into contact with a very clever and energetic person, Miss Sylvia Beach, who had been running for some years previously a small English bookshop and lending library in Paris under the name of Shakespeare and Company. This brave woman risked what professional publishers did not wish to do. She took the manuscript and handed it to the printers. <clears throat> These were very scrupulous and understanding French printers in Dijon, the capital of the French printing press. In fact, I attached no small importance to the work being done well and quickly. My eyesight still permitted me at the time to read the proofs myself, and thus it came about that thanks to extra work and the kindness of Mr. <coughs> Durantier, <coughs> pardon me, after the manuscript had been delivered and the first printed copy was sent to me for my 40th birthday on the 2nd of February, 1922. You are, however, in error when you think that Shakespeare and Company never published anything before or after Ulysses. As a matter of fact, Miss Sylvia Beach bought out a little volume of 13 poems of mine entitled Poems Peignet in 1927 and also a volume of essays and two letters of protest concerning the book I am engaged in writing since 1922. This volume was bought out in 1929 and it bears the title Our Ex... Our ex our examination round his factification for incamination of work in progress. That is difficult to say. Our examination round his factification for incamination of work in progress. The continental publication of Ulysses proved, however, to be merely the beginning of complications in the United Kingdom and the United States. <clears throat> Shipments of copies of Ulysses were made to America and to Great Britain, with the result that all copies were seized and burnt by the custom authorities of New York and Folkestone. This created a very peculiar situation. On the one hand, I was unable to acquire the copyright in the United States since I could not comply with the requirements of the American copyright law which demands the republication in the United States of any English book which published elsewhere within a period of six months after the date of such publication, and on the other hand demanded for Ulysses which increased every demand for Ulysses which increased every year in proportion as the book penetrated into larger circles gave the opportunity for any unscrupulous person to have it printed and sold clandestinely. This practice provoked a protest signed by 167 writers of all nationalities, and I even obtained an injunction against one of these unscrupulous persons in a New York court. I am enclosing copies of both these documents, which may interest you. This injunction, however, proved of no avail, as the enjoined defendant resumed his practice very soon again under another name and with a different mode of procedure, namely a photographic forgery of the Paris edition which contained the falsification of the Dijon printer's imprint. It is therefore with the greatest sincerity that I wish you all possible success in your courageous venture both as regards to the legalization of Ulysses as well as its publication, and I willingly certify hereby that not only will your edition be the only authentic one in the United States, but also the only one there on which I will be receiving royalties. Personally, I will be very gratified if your enterprise is successful as it will permit American readers who have always proved very kind to me to obtain the authenticated text of my book without running the risk of helping some unscrupulous person in his pur pur purpose whew, some unscrupulous person in his purpose of making profit for himself alone out of the work of another to which he can advance no claim of moral ownership. 
there may be some other points in which you are interested and I hope that should you that should you be over in Europe again this year you will oblige me by communicating with me either direct or through my son so as to enable me to elucidate my point you may still be in doubt about yours sincere, sincerely signed James Joyce <clears throat> Yes, so he was unable to obtain copyright for it in the United States because the law required him to get that copyright within six months of, in it, of its initial publication, but he was not able to obtain copyright because it could not legally be sold in the United States. So he was not able to get his copyright in the required time span of under six months uh, because during that entire time span, it was not legal to sell the book here, uh, and they wouldn't grant him a copyright on a book that wasn't legal to sell. <laughs> and this is a book that today is very much considered a classic here in the United States. All right, so we have the, um, the Gabler edition from 1984 that we can take a look at. This is the one that claims, he claimed to be the definitive edition, but that as soon as he published, people criticized him for how he had made the edition. I also have this, this very large boxed set here that is James Joyce Ulysses, The Manuscript and First Printings Compared. Mm. And I will pull out volume one of that so that we can take a look. The other item that I pulled for today is an item here called Ulysses at Buffalo. Uh, a, centenary, a centenary exhibition. I don't know anything about it, but it appears to be telling a lot of the story. Here's actually a photo of uh, James Joyce and Sylvia Beach at the Shakespeare and at Shakespeare and Company, circa 1921. So this is a book that has photographs and captions of an exhibit that happened in Buffalo, New York. Which is interesting, but I think we'll enjoy reading the book a little bit more. So The Gabbler, we glanced at a little bit earlier while I was reading the Wikipedia article. It has a foreword, it's got the episodes. So episode 11 appears to have been one of the um, <coughs> scandalous ones that people, uh, or that got it banned. Um, episode 11 is called Sirens. Um, so we may glance at that. Let me, I, I'm gonna actually read from the, the facsimile version. James, Joyce Ulysses, a facsimile of the manuscript. So I'll read the very beginning, and then I will jump to episode 11 if I can find it, and we'll see if we can tell what was so scandalous. Uh, if I can find the beginning of the actual book. Biographical description of the manuscript. How about the book? Oh, no, we're not doing this. This is actually like photographs of the handwritten manuscript, which is lovely, uh, but not useful for reading on stream when I have like 15 minutes left. I think we go back and I read from the first American printing. Because it's, it's not going to be the gabbler, which the gabbler is disputed as to whether it's authoritative or not. Um, 
so I won't read from that one. Now you need to add Ulysses to your reading list for legal research. Sorry to add to your workload. Don's pearls ready for clutching at. Yes, yes, yes. All right, all right. Let's read from this book that is falling apart. Remember all the happy times you had. <clears throat> Sorry, I just need a tiny sip of water and then I will reposition this. <clears throat> This is the first U.S. publication of the book. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown ungirdled was stain sustained gently behind him by the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, Introibo ad altare dei. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called up coarsely, Come up, Kinch! Come up, you fearful Jesuit! It is quite a large S indeed. Yeah, uh, this book is no longer under copyright, so I have no fear of reading it. Um, Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the round gun rest. He faced about and blessed and blessed gravely thrice in the tower, the surrounding country, and the awaking mountains. Then, catching sight of Stephen Daedalus, he bent toward him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Uh, Stephen Daedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him, equine in its length, and at the light, untonsured hair, grained and hued like pale oak. Buck Mulligan peeped an instant under the mirror and then covered the bowl smartly. Back to barracks, he said sternly. He added in a preacher's tone, For this, O oh dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine body and soul and blood and ons. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents, one moment. A little trouble about those white corpuscles. Silence, all. He paused sideways, he peered sideways up and gave a long low whistle of a call, then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points. Ah, uh, Chrysostomos. Two strong, shrill whistles answered through the calm. Thanks, old chap, he cried briskly. That will do nicely. Switch off the current, will you? He skipped off the gun rest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathering about his legs the loose folds of his gown. The plump, shadowed face and sullen oval jowl recalled a prelate, patron of arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. The mockery of it, he said gaily. Your absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over the parapet, laughing to himself. Stephen Daedalus stepped up, followed him warily half, er, yeah, followed him warily halfway and sat down on the edge of the gun rest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet. Dipped the brush in the bowl and lathered cheek and neck, cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. My name is absurd, too. Malachi Mulligan. Two dactyls. But it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny like the buck himself. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the aunt to fork out 20 quid? He laid the brush aside and, laughing with delight, cried, Will he come? The jejune Jesuit? Ceasing, he began to shave with care. Tell me, Mulligan, Stephen said quietly. Yes, my love. How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower? Buck Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. God, isn't he dreadful? He said frankly, a ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. God, these bloody English. Bursting with money and indigestion because he comes from Oxford. You know, Daedalus, you have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Kinch, the knife blade he shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about a black panther, Stephen said. Where is his gun case? 
A woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was, Stephen said with energy and growing fear, out here in the dark with a man I don't know raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther. You saved men from drowning. I'm not a hero, however. If he stays on, here I am here. If he stays on here, I am off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trousers' pockets hastily. Scutter, he cried thickly. He came over to the gun rest and, thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket, said, Let us alone of your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on the show by its corner. Uh, sorry. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty, crumpled handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly. Then, gazing over the handkerchief, he said, The bard's nose rag. A new art color for our Irish poets. Snot green. You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair oak pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly, isn't the sea what Algy calls it? A gray sweet mother? The snot green sea. The scrotum tightening sea. Epi oinopa ponton. Ah, Daedalus, the Greeks, I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Thalata, Thalata, she is our great sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over the, uh, to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mailboat, clearing the harbor mouth of, Kings, of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly, his great searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. I guess I didn't say that gloomily. Uh, someone killed her. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch, when your dying mother asked you, Buck Mulligan said. I'm Hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and you refused. There is something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again lightly his farther cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely mummer, he mum mum murmured to himself, Kinch the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and with care, in silence, seriously. Stephen, an elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his brow and gazed at the fraying edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain, that was not yet the pain of love, fretted his heart. Silently, in a dream, she had come to him after her death, her wasted body within its loose brown grave clothes giving off an odor of wax and rosewood, her breath that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuff edge, she saw the sea hailed by a great sweet mother by, well, by the well-fed voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed, holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud groaning vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped his razor blade. Ah, poor dog's body, he said in a kind voice. I must give you a shirt and a few nose rags. How are the secondhand breeks? They fit well enough, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his underlip. The mockery of it, he said contentedly. Second leg they should be. God knows what poxy bowsy left them off. I have a lovely pair with a hair stripe gray. You'll be spiffing in them. You'll look spiffing in them. I'm not joking, Kinch. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they're gray. He can't wear them. Buck Mulligan told his face in the mirror. Etiquette is etiquette. He kills his mother, but he can't wear gray trousers. He folded his razor neatly and, with stroking palps of fingers, felt the smooth skin. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea and to the plump face with its smoke-blue mobile eyes. That fellow I was with in the ship last night, said Buck Mulligan, says you have GPI. He's up in Dottyville with Connolly Norman, general paralysis of the insane. He swept the mirror and a half and he swept the mirror a half circle in the air to flash the tidings abroad in sunlight now radiant on the sea his curling shaven lips laughed and the edges of his white
His curling, shaven lips laughed and the edges of his white glittering teeth. Laughter seized all his strong, well-knit trunk. Look at yourself, he said, you dreadful bard. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him, cleft by a crooked crack on end, as he and others see me. Who chose this face for me, this dog's body to rid of vermin? It asks me to. I pinched it out of the skivvy's room, Buck Mulligan said. It does her all right. The aunt always keeps plain-looking servants for Malachi. Lead him not into temptation, and her name is Ursula. Le laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes. The rage of Caliban at not seeing his face in a mirror, he said, if Wilde were only alive to see you. Drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, it is a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking glass of a servant. Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arm in Stephen's and walked him round the tower, his razor and mirror clacking in the pocket where he had thrust them. It's not fair to tease you like that, Kinch, is it? He said kindly. God knows you have more spirit than any of them. Parried again. He fears the lancet of my art, and I fear that of his, the cold steel pen. So far, I haven't found anything particularly obscene. Um, it is a little bit dense, a little bit... But partly because of unfamiliarity of the language, uh, making it difficult to sight read. If I had time to actually sit down with it and read it, I could parse it better and actually read it more intelligibly for somebody listening. Um, but that's owing more to the fact that I've never read it before and I'm encountering this for the first time. Uh, I'm gonna look and see if I can find 11. but I don't know exactly where it would be. And there's not like chapters in this one. So maybe we pull out the other one and see if I can find a passage in the sirens that might be particularly scandalous. Anyway, did anybody who was watching find something scandalous? Cause I didn't. Oh, go have your weekly brain cleaning? <laughs> Enjoy, I guess? Uh, we will be leaving shortly, um, <clears throat> so you won't miss much. Page 548. I'm just curious, because the legal case said that it was section 11 here, or chapter 11, or episode 11, or whatever, that was the problem. Bronze by gold heard the hoof, hoof irons, steely ringing. Imperthinthin, chips picking chips off rocky thumbnail chips. You horrid, horrid, and gold flushed more. A husky fife note blew. Blue, blue, bloom, bloom is on the gold pinnacled hair. A jumping rose of satiny breast of satin, rose of Castile, trilling, trilling, idol, idolores. Peep, who's in the peep of gold? Tink cried to bronze in pity, and a call, pure, long and throbbing, long and dying call, decoy, soft word, but look, the bright stars fade, notes chirping, answer. O oh, rose, Castile, the morn is breaking, jingle, jingle, jaunted jingling, Coin rang, clock clacked, a vowel sonas. I could rebound of garter, not leave thee, smack. Le cloche, cloche, smack thigh, thigh smack, a vowel warm, sweetheart, goodbye. Jingle blue, bloomed crashing chords when love ab ab absorbs. War, war, the tympanum, a sail, a veil, a wave upon the waves, lost, throstle fluted. All is lost now. Horn, Hawthorn. When first he saw, alas, I'm wondering if there's some bit with the notations that I'm not getting because I didn't look at that part. Because um, this seems very different in form than what we were reading before. Gotcha. There is a little bit. But 
whatever. Some bizarre poetry. I still don't see anything that is overtly sexual here. Anyway, <laughs> you can see why this segment would give issues separating intentional and accidental errors. Well, so some of the notation here, um, it, the part in brackets, in actually reading this, you would either read it as bald, deaf, pat, brought, pad, knife, took up, or as deaf, bald, pat, brought, pad, knife, took up. Original text is apparently bald, deaf, and the new text is deaf, bald. Um, so the way it's printed here, it has the old and the new text lumped together with brackets so that you understand which is which, which honestly makes it almost annoying to read, but I guess for literary analysis purposes is useful. Um, I would prefer to read this without that. but. I, I'm apparently not the audience that it was written for in that case. Anyway, um, we are at time. So let me go ahead and uh, switch back. Um, we will be rating someone. Give me one second and I will tell you what we're looking at next week. Um, I hope that you found this interesting. I found it fascinating to, to learn about um, James Joyce's Ulysses. I was unaware of its history. Um, I'm curious to sort of read it now and see what I can learn. Um, but honestly, reading the court case or reading the, ju the judge's opinion about it, I found utterly fascinating. Um, I had a good time and I hope that you did as well. Um, what we will be looking at next week will be, as soon as I can get my spreadsheet open, I will tell you. Um, it's architecture related. Yes, okay, so today was James Joyce's Ulysses. Next week we are looking at the Winifred Parsons Architecture Notebook. That's all I know. It is Winifred Parsons Architecture Notebook. Uh, that's what I'm going to look at next week, and we'll find out what it is together. Um, and then I am working on the week after uh, trying to do a program on olives. Uh, and, and so I'm exploring our collections to find out what we have on the topic of olives. Uh, so next week, Winifred Parsons Architecture Notebook and the week after, whatever I can find on the topic of olives. Uh, so I hope that you will join me in the future for those episodes of uh, archival adventures. Um, it is a, a pure joy having you here. I hope that you enjoy the show and that I see you again soon. I am going to set up a raid um, to someone. I believe the Monterey Bay Aquarium is live with bird cam today. Let's just see. Yeah, the aviary cam today on Monterey Bay Aquarium. I'm glad you enjoy it, Crafty Becky. Thank you, Rykar. Uh, so we're going to go over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium for the aviary cam today. Um, and I hope that you have uh, a good rest of your day. It has been a joy. Uh, exploring this all with you and I look forward to seeing you again soon. So I will see you all later. <laughs>